All right. Can everyone hear me? I guess I can't hear a yes. I'm seeing a nod. I'm going to hope that that one nod is general. Uh, my name is John Fassman. I'm moderating this panel. I'm the digital editor, the American digital editor for The Economist. Uh, and I also have written a series of articles on the future of food, focused in particular on uh, alternative proteins that's going to come out in, in next week's issue. It was through that reporting that I, I got in touch with Good Food Institute and this conference. So I think this is going to be a great session. Thank you all for being here. I'd like to introduce our participants. Um, we have, and I hope they'll share their screens, they do. We have uh, Fengru Lin, who is the co-founder of Turtle Tree, which is a startup that is focused on making cell-based milk and high-value lactoproteins. We also have Brian Kresge, who runs the business incubator for Hormel, which is, of course, one of America's oldest and biggest meat purveyors. There are two other panelists who I hope are going to join us momentarily. Uh, Christy Legali is from Rebellious Foods, and Rebellious makes plant-based chicken nuggets, but also works on production techniques for plant-based proteins. And we'll have Laura Rush, who is the vice president in charge of frozen foods for Walmart, which is, of course, America's biggest retailer. Um, so that is the panelists. Let me get started here. Um, I'd like to, so we have with us on the panel two startups, um, one working on high value lactoproteins and one on plant-based chicken and production techniques and two incumbents. We have a huge meat company and the world's largest retailer. That grouping, to my mind, speaks to the convergence and maturation of the space. Innovation isn't something that's happening far off in some ivory tower. It's happening everywhere, and it's being noticed in real time by people and companies who have the power to really change our food systems, and in doing so, help bring about a better, cleaner, greener world. And so with that, I'm really happy to start the panel. Let's start, if I can, with the startups. Um, Fengru. I really enjoyed speaking to you and hearing your origin story, so to speak. Um, and I wonder whether you can share it with the audience. How did you find your way from cheese making in Vermont to high value protein manufacturing in Singapore and the Bay Area? And what is the problem that Turtle Tree aims to solve? Sure, hi, hi everyone. Um, so again, my name is Feng Ru. I am a Singaporean born and raised. My background was actually in tech. Um, I used to work for tech companies, Salesforce, Google, and about four years ago, when I was still in Google, I had a hobby to make cheese. It was quite a fanatic period of time. I was in Vermont for a few weeks, and I learned and to appreciate how complex milk is. The same starting fluid with a different time used to press it, a different pH, a different um, amount of um, acid and so on that you add to it, can result in so many different cheeses. So it got me to appreciate the 2,000 different ingredients in milk, and that in order to achieve these high value dairy products like cheese, butter, cream, yogurt, you need the full milk. You, you can't just have single proteins and so on. So I came back to Singapore and tried to replicate this whole process. Obviously, there are no cows in Singapore, no milk. So I had to go down to Indonesia and Thailand, trying to look for good sources of raw, fresh milk. And in these areas, there are still some small farm holders who do a lot of contract farming and um, hormones that are being pumped into the cows. And as a result, the milk quality is, is not as good as that in Vermont. So when I was still working for Google, I, I came back to Singapore. There was this guy on stage, uh, his name is Max. He's now my co-founder, but back then he was the CEO of a different tech company. He was on stage in Google sharing about different transformative technologies. And back then, um, he was talking about Memphis Meats, which is upside food today, but back then it was Memphis, and Blue Nalu. So mind you, this was four or five years ago, and this guy was talking about accessing meat without going through the animal. That was so intriguing for me. So we started chatting after the talk about using perhaps similar methods to make milk. So back then, nobody was making full milk. There were some companies making certain proteins, ingredients, but they needed full milk which got us to speak to a lot of um, scientists, a lot of industry folks, and came to the cell-based method. So in 2019, um, we, we put in some of our own cash, we did a lot of research, 
And the middle of the year, we made some breakthroughs, and that was when we filed our patents. And that's, that's how we started the company. Okay, thank you. Christy, let me ask you the same sort of question. When we spoke, you identified a cost bottleneck in the production process that I hadn't considered. So tell me a bit about Rebellious and, and the problem it aims to solve. Yeah, sure. Hello, everybody. I'm Christy Legali. I'm the founder and CEO of Rebellious Foods. Um, it's great to be here. Yeah, um, as John mentioned, the Rebellious Foods were working on making plant-based meat available and affordable for everyone. So our goal is to essentially bring down the cost of making plant-based meat through innovative technology for food processing and better ways, methodologies, and actually novel food production equipment that makes it possible to make more, better, um, and a much more much higher volumes of making plant-based meat. Um, as, as John, you just alluded to, essentially what we're trying to do is reduce the overall cost of goods sold of making plant-based meat. Um, there are essentially two things that make plant-based meat very expensive. The ingredients are very expensive, but then also the actual labor, manufacturing, overhead, processing time, um, sanitation time are all really important parts of adding to the cost of that, that's where we have an opportunity to bring down the cost and at the same time, increase the volume to much larger, um, you know, much, much larger volume, which enables us to eventually make more and better plant-based meat. And then that will ultimately help bring down the cost of ingredients as well as we're making a much higher volume. So um, as many of you may know, in the United States alone, we produce over 108 billion pounds of animal-based meat. Roughly half of that is chicken. Um, and yet we only make about one half of 1%, a half of a percent of that in plant-based meat. So we're really working to change that equation for plant-based meat. Okay, thank you, Christy. Let's turn to the incumbents. Brian, your position on this panel is unique, but it, I don't think it's, it's necessarily as unique in, in the real world. I think there are a lot of incumbents who are starting to think about plant-based proteins. So just tell us a bit about, about how and why one of America's biggest producers of animal proteins thinks about this space, about alternative proteins. Yeah, hi, uh, Brian Kresge, I'm general manager of, of Hormel's venturing and, and incubator unit. Um, you know, Hormel's heritage is in is in animal protein, but today we're a globally branded food company with 25% of our portfolio that's outside of uh, non-meat uh, with iconic brands like Skippy and Justin's Nut Butters, um, Holy Guacamole, and recently we acquired the planters snack nuts business. So, so we have experience outside of, of animal protein, right? But I think our company understands that food culture is changing at a rapid pace and, and people are showing this increasing curiosity and motivation to try and great tasting alternative forms of protein across the spectrum of lifestyles. We believe we can play an important role in, in the space with the purpose of creating outstanding tasting, accessible, alternative protein forward food choices. I mean, ultimately we've, we've been around, I think a little over 126 years. Um, you do that by believing in, in offering consumers and customers choice and, and meet them where they're going with their food choices. And that's, and that's what we aspire to do. Okay, thank you. I hope that, that Laura will be joining us shortly. When she does, I'll, I'll have questions for her too. But let me come back now to, to Fengru. Um, I think most people, when they think about cost and access, think about the point of purchase, meaning you know, getting people like Laura at Walmart to buy more products, getting companies like Brian's to distribute more plant-based products. But you began by trying to make cell-based milk and then pivoted to lactoproteins, and in so doing became effectively a business-to-business -business company rather than a consumer-facing one. I wonder if you can tell us a bit about the opportunities you see in that in that B2B space. Sorry, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, so when we talk about the dairy industry, there are so many complexities, so many layers that have companies just focus on a single um, area. So for example, on the dairy processing side, you have the dairy processors who work with the farmers to get the milk and process the milk. You have um, the CPG brands who will then take the milk and package into products, and then you sell it to folks like Walmart. So for us, we needed to think about where Turtle Tree wants to be and what we're good at. 
So at the core of Turtle Tree is technology. We want to keep ourselves very nimble, very agile, and technology heavy. So we, we don't necessarily want to go into the depths of um, running a processing plant. We, we want to work with um, CDMOs, contract manufacturers. We don't necessarily want to build a brand of our own. We would rather work um, in collaboration with uh, folks like Hormel or other CPG brands um, to launch new brands. So as a result, um, where we stand, we want to be able to use technology to provide products for the market. So why lactoprotein? Why, why specifically lactoferrin, which is our first product? If we look at dairy milk today, it's at $2 a gallon. It's not something that we can get to in the early days. So we don't want to have a race to the bottom in terms of price point. But what we can get out of the milk that we can produce is lactoferrin. Lactoferrin on the market today is um, traded at $700 to $3,000 per kg because it's such a small amount of, lact of lactoferrin within, within milk. There's 0 0.1 grams in the whole liter of milk. And this protein, lactoferrin, is known to be good for your gut, good for your gut-brain axis, uh, good for your immunity, antimicrobial, antiviral. And there are even some, um, some reports recently that say um, it helps to prevent COVID. So this, this ingredient is something that is very highly valued. Currently on the market, is about 80% goes into infant nutrition. So there's a lot of blue ocean there for us to explore in terms of performance nutrition, in terms of um, working together with the plant-based milk folks um, to make better for you milk products for the market. So our B2B model also allows us to tap on the extensive experience of existing CPG brands or, or companies um, through regulatory as well as branding. Um, so, so this is how we, we envision placing Turtle Tree in this whole marketplace. Okay, thank you. Christy, your company is following two paths. On the one hand, you're making plant-based chicken nuggets, which means you're competing mm -hmm. with one of the cheapest and most ubiquitous proteins on the market. Mm -hmm. On the other, you're working on production techniques using machinery that's very specialized, that's quite rare, so you're in that sense, there's sort of two opposite paths. Which one do you think shows the most promise in terms of in terms of reducing costs and boosting access? Yeah, so they they both do because of course they are integrated and related in the in the work that we're trying to do. Um, but you're absolutely right. Rebellious Foods is um, headed towards being actually a two revenue com a two revenue stream company. We currently make um, Rebellious branded plant based chicken nuggets, patties, and tenders, and soon to be um, a whole slew of other really exciting um, plant based breaded chicken products that come in a variety of different forms. Um, we we produce those ourselves. We run our own manufacturing facility in West Seattle, and that is a, a, a quickly growing revenue stream. Um, the sales, even in the last few months, have just tripled, and I, we expect them even to quadruple in the next month or so. So it's it's been really a fast-paced, exciting time for us. Um, but you're absolutely right. Um, the, the work that we're doing kind of on the other side of the house is the development of our new um, production system. We call it the Mach 1 production system. And what this does is it actually reduces labor cost by 50%. It reduces um, cycle times or sanitation cycle times by a significant amount, shortening it so more of the production time can go towards actual production of products. And it actually reduces at most floor space and triples the amount of product being made in that same space in a factory. So there's a lot of benefits across the board and what that fundamentally does is uh, reduces the cost to a significant amount. We believe it'll be about 60% right off the bat, um, making animal plant-based chicken, our plant-based chicken um, on par with the price of, uh, of plant, or part of the animal, sorry, plant-based chicken or our plant-based chicken on par with the price of animal-based chicken very, very soon here. We are in the process of deploying it. We wanna be uh, the customer of our own first uh, equipment set. And then we do intend to sell that equipment and sell that in intellectual properly, property for others to use because this has two benefits for us. First of all, it, it, it helps the entire plant-based meat industry because we know that um, contract manufacturers who could better make plant-based meat if they had our system, our new Mach 1 production system, if they had that, they could make 
our products better. They could make other people's products better. They can make them faster, cheaper, um, higher quality. So it ends up being both of them together. You know, the, it, food production is such a complex thing that we know that it's not just enough to make, uh, to design and be the owners and sellers of, of, of equipment and the intellectual property. We want to be the deployers of that equipment and intellectual property as well, because fundamentally it transforms the industry when it is actually being used. And so we, 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 like, we like to say that we walk the walk and you know walk the talk, I should say, um, because we're actually using the equipment that we are purporting to others to actually purchase as well in the near future. <laughs> but we are actually deploying our equipment um, by December, January of, of this uh, this year and early next year. That's great. Thank you. Um, Brian, one reason why Singapore, where Fengru comes from and, and where I live for many years, has been so supportive of plant-based proteins is that there's no incumbent meat industry, right? Here there is, and we have seen, uh, you know, dairy producers object to oat milk being called milk, object to plant-based proteins being called meat. Um, what is the role in your view beyond 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 just Hormel, but the, the broader role of incumbents in boosting access and bringing down costs of plant-based proteins? Yeah, I mean I think there's a lot of roles that that we can we can play, but I, I think at its core, um, expanding our access starts with delivering great tasting products right uh, for for consumers i think the data shows that people right now <clears throat> right now at least are are eating both traditional animal-based proteins um along with uh, alternative proteins and they're not going to compromise on taste i know that's something that i've learned um over my my 20 20 years so and i you know i saw that recently um, at a trade event, the National Pizza Expo in Las Vegas. So we we have a presence there. Um, we uh, essentially operate a full restaurant at that that pizza show, and we debuted um, the second generation of our Happy Little Plants plant based pepperoni. So pizza, one of the most iconic foods um, in in America, pepperoni, one of the most iconic toppings trying to give people choice, a great tasting plant-based choice in pepperoni. We saw a real opportunity there. You know, and at that show, whether it was vegan pizza chains who might not have come into our, our booth before, or traditional operators who have been customers of Hormel Foods for decades, the, the universal comment that, that we received was, I can't believe the taste of this. I have the confidence to put this on my pizza and um, on my on my menu, and so I, I think that just speaks to um, the taste the taste part of it. I I think another key enabler to expanding access is for companies like Hormel Foods to be humble enough to to understand that um, we've got to work with the emerging companies and entrepreneurs in this space. There's certain things that we are great at. Right, and certain competencies that we bring. And as I talk to um, you know different companies in this space and the new technologies that they're they're bringing to market, um, it's really exciting. And so I think a key enabler to ex expanding that access is for companies like Hormel um, and others in the in the meat in industry to, to partner with those companies to help bring these great tasting um, plant-based products to the marketplace. Let me ask one follow-up question, and this is I'm I'm curious about your thoughts and, and also Fengers and Christie's. I'm someone who has sort of who's been a vegan off and on for many years, and I've noticed in the past. I don't know, since I moved back to the States, certainly. So in the past four years, at least, the taste of these products has gotten much, much better. What is it, do you think, that has changed, that has allowed, it, it, it just seems like taste plays much more of a role than it did before. Why has taste gotten so much better? Maybe I can start. I think it's, um, sorry, Brian, uh, just a quick one. Um, maybe I think uh, it could be consumer acceptance. I think with the younger folks um, being educated from young, that we need to do something for the environment. Animal agriculture is not good for 
animal cruelty, the environment, they are demanding more and more plant-based products, alternative proteins. And with this surge of interest, there's more consumers um, and more choices. So I think brands, CPG brands, um, dairy companies, food companies will have uh, more to work with and they can test out the market more. And as a result, um, there is a higher quality of product that come out of this market. Christy, Brian, thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll dive in as well. I think they just genuinely are better. Um, more people have put more time and more energy into it and more people have tasted it, um, as, as she mentioned. And it's like, you know, we actually have worked on this problem and we got better at it. Um, one of the things that we're really passionate about at Rebellious Foods is that we want to really represent that really great work in um, flavor, in better flavor management and better um, flavors and better texture and better um, binders by being able to scale the manufacturing. And, and I only come back to that because one of the things that we learned pretty early on in our manufacturing of plant-based meat was that the failure to scale correctly would impact flavor very detrimentally. And so one of the things that we designed into our new production system was a very, very careful heat, heat management system that ensured that temperatures of like plant-based meats and plant-based proteins and plant-based materials that were being processed were kept at a very low temperature. And that preserves the really great work that flavor houses have done to provide really high quality flavors. But as long as we don't over process that, um, that's a really important part of making sure that flavor ends up in the customer's palate. Thanks, Brian. I would build off with, with both what Feng Ru and, and Christy stated. I, I think first, um, people are definitely showing this increase in curiosity and it's certainly um, being driven by um, younger generations. And I, I just remember, uh, I think it's now three years ago as, as Hormel was kind of starting to execute our first experiment in the space, I actually was able to, to break off on a, on a family vacation about four hours north of the Twin Cities where I'm based. Um, near the boundary waters, right? So top of Minnesota, right by Canada, family vacation. Um, and my my we went to kind of the last city, Grand Marais, before going up the Gunflint Trail and, and kind of going on our, our, our trip and stopped off at a restaurant and it had Beyond Meat on the menu and uh, my niece and nephew were there and I'm in the middle of this experiment and I'm just asking, I'm like, well, why? Why are you guys interested? And they proceeded to give me a 10 to 15 minute lecture on why all this made sense, right? Um, so that was my my clear focus group there and really hit me um, on, on on how this market was, was going to expand. So I definitely think it's that, right? I think the other portion of what Christy had had talked about. I mean, um, the quality of the ingredients, the technology, the flavor, it's improved. I mean, one of my my key partners on this journey for Hormel is in R&D. And um, about six, eight years ago, she worked on a, a project for one of our, our family of companies in the, in the plant-based space before it was really starting to gain, um, gain traction. And you know she's now come back on, and, and plant based is one of her key key focus areas. And she's commented to me; she's amazed with how much things have changed just in that in that time frame. So, and and I I think you're going to see that pace and that innovation continue to accelerate, so we can get to those great tasting great tasting products. Let me pivot slightly off something something you said. We've been talking about products for a bit now. I'd like to talk briefly about, about markets because bringing down costs and improving access isn't gonna look the same everywhere. Now, Fengru, lactoferrin, as you mentioned, is a very high value ingredient, but you're looking hardest, I think, at, at, at two markets, right? You told me Singapore and the United States. Why those two markets? And more broadly, I wonder if you could talk a bit about how you decide where to sell what is most important? Is it size of the market, regulatory environment, demographics, all of the above? Um, great question. I think I'll start with uh, the, the last bit. How do we decide um, what product to sell? I think it's really talking to our customers. 
um, when we talk to our customers, they, they challenge us. Can you make milk at $2 a gallon? Um, I think uh, that, that is when we realize that it's a high value ingredients that we should be talking about. Lactoferrin is the first, but it's not the last. We have a whole pipeline of different ingredients coming from milk. We have things like alpha lactobumin, which is another high value protein. Uh, we have um, human milk oligosaccharides. These are complex sugars that are found in human milk. And um, all of this have a lot of gut, gut benefits, um, immunity benefits, and so on. So when it comes to selecting our first markets, Singapore and US, well, I think um, Singapore is where I come from. But uh, at the same time, Singapore is an island country. So we have a massive food security challenge. Um, last year, the government came up with a mandate. We want to be able to produce 30% of our nutritional needs within the country by the year 2030. And as a result of that, the government is all hands on deck to support different industries and companies to make that happen. Um, we've got the National Research Institute, ASTAR, running a lot of uh, programs with businesses. We have Singapore Food Agency, is one of, um, I, I dare say, is probably the most uh, progressive um, food agency of the world. Um, they launched uh, the first cell-based meat um, from Eat Just um, earlier this year. Um, and uh, we, we have um, ESG, EDB, all the different government agencies making sure that um, we can be successful. So um, this built a very cohesive environment for, for this to happen. And Singapore is a great springboard to the rest of Asia as well. It's highly regarded um, in terms of food safety. Um, so with Singapore being that benchmark, I think the rest of Asia would be a lot smoother as well. As for US, I think um, where we are, we are here around the Davis region. UC Davis has one of the world's deepest, um, most advanced milk teams. The milk team is actually made up of five different labs. It's not just one lab. So this cohesive environment is so important because they get to work together. There's a lab focused just on characterizing the molecules. There's a lab focused on going through gut studies, a lab going through um, human health claims, and so on. So all of them work together to help us uh, push product to, to market. Um, the talent around here is also incredible. With the environment of the different um, food tech startups in this space, I think uh, the talent in this area, we're just two hours away from San Francisco as well, um, makes it a really ripe environment uh, for us to build our global R&D HQ here. Um, there are also certain parts in the US um, that have very beneficial manufacturing, um, taxation laws, and so on. Um, and of course, it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest market in the world uh, for, for food. So this is why we, we chose these two countries. And as a side note, I think um, I was on a panel uh, with uh, the CEO of Eat Just in Singapore. And they, before launching cell based meat, hired a couple of consultancy companies to assess which is the best country to launch with. Um, and they, they assessed 10 of them. So it, it takes into consideration raw materials, access to market, size of market, regulatory uh, framework, and everything else. And they, they came up with the conclusion that Singapore is the place to launch the, their cell based meat. So I think uh, these different data different data driven decisions um, also help us to to establish that Singapore and US is, is the best place to be. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Christy, let me turn to you. So a similar market question. Um, on the one hand, plant based chicken is an extremely well populated category. So how do you distinguish yourself in that category? And on the other hand, industrial food manufacturing machines is a super niche category. It's very specific. It seems like the opposite <laughs> problem, right? How do you break in and how to ensure how do you ensure that when you do, it'll be in a way that 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 is beneficial to, to alternative proteins? Yeah, that's a great question. And and again, they are very much related because um, it is easy to feel like the um, plant-based chicken industry is very crowded. But as I mentioned earlier, it actually isn't. You know, the majority of plant-based meat production in the United States, at least, um, is primarily burgers and hamburgers and other types of um, products. Now, there are still a lot of chicken nuggets, patties and tenders, but the majority of it is, is actually hamburgers 
hamburgers and, and the volume of it is mostly hamburgers. Um, that's not a surprise. Those are easier products to make. Um, it's a lot nicer to run your production facility when all you at the end, all you have to do is make the, the patty and you don't have to go on and bread batter and fry it. That's a whole other thing. And if, if anybody ever wants to do it, be a guest helper in our facility and learn how to do this stuff, we, we're always welcome to guest helpers. Um, but it really is a unique, um, a unique product to make that vast majority of the chicken industry or replicate the vast majority of the chicken industry that is making bread battered fried products. And, and that's fundamentally where um, we see an enormous opportunity. Now, a lot of people are getting into it. We've seen Impossible and Beyond come out with products. We've seen um, short-term opportunities at KFC with Beyond Meat. Um, and these are all really exciting opportunities. They, they de-risk a lot of things for us, that's for sure because we know that chicken is a volume effort. Um, if, if we're making small amounts of the biggest and most commonly eaten meat in the entire world, which is chicken, then we have a very long way to go. And we also believe that it, where our expertise lies is not necessarily in the one-off opportunities, maybe at um, limited time offer situations. We serve eight and soon to be 10 major school districts all across the West Coast, with plant-based chicken nuggets that qualify for the National School Lunch Program. Um, we serve uh, food service, restaurants who are serving our products without even you know, necessarily sharing the rebellious name, but they share our mission fundamentally. And also, oh, and Laura's here, fantastic. Um, and I'll just finish what I was saying, but, um, and then we also sell our products into third, um, third party white label opportunities. Um, soon to be in Canada, I'll, I'll let that one come out in our, in our press release soon. And I'm hoping for announcements for a South America and a couple of other countries countries where those volume products where people are expecting exactly the same product because it's so well manufactured um, is, is a really important um, niche market um, for the volume effort that we really have to tackle. But you're absolutely right. There are not a lot of people working on um, the boots on the ground, on the production floor, better tools and manufacturing for making plant-based meat. In fact, I'm not sure we've actually met another one, um, but we really fundamentally believe that to meet that mission of volume customers for the school lunches in you know, San Ramon Valley and for Everett School District, that is going to require us to make the products at a much lower cost. And as a result, our technology is key to that strategy. And, um, and we can't wait to deploy it in the very, very, very near future, in the next few months. <laughs> okay, thank you. Laura, good to see you. I'm glad, I'm glad you made it on. I'm glad we got over to Tech Hurdles. Let me, whoops, did you just disappear? All right, well, on to the next question, I guess. Um, Brian, let's talk about, about markets and placements. Um, is your range of plant-based offerings the same in every market? Do you distinguish between markets? Have you found that some areas or demographics like certain things more? How do you decide what to sell where? Yeah, um, I think for us, we're in the early innings of this journey and an alternative protein. And I mean, I think you can try to go wide and broad or narrow and deep. And, you know, we we have made the conscious decision um, as we learn this marketplace that we should first start um, here in the United States. And our focus is on the food service channel. And, and part of that is just a differentiating capability that we have um, in that we have a direct sales team that can really go out, talk to operators and get rapid input that can help us then develop um, the, the best products that we can for the, for the marketplace. And we've even gone further and said, we really wanna concentrate on pizza toppings because uh, that is in the DNA of Hormel Foods from the from the very beginning, right? So it's a space that's very important to us. Now, having said that, we'll take those learnings and we'll share them in internally. And certainly, international is an opportunity for us. And if we see the the right type of of um, uh, potential opportunity, um, then we can kind of take our resources and, and commercialize. Thank you. I'd like to markets. make sure 
that we leave enough time for audience questions. Um, so please start asking them in the chat. I know there have been some questions that have come up so far, um, but I just have not been able to sort of bounce between monitoring the chat and 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 monitoring the conversation. Laura, hi, I'm you're so here. Sorry. All right, sorry. Good. <laughs> now. Before we go to all these questions, let me ask you something. We've just been talking about products and product placement. One of the one of the businesses I spoke to for for part of my series on 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 the future of food was really adamant. He ran a plant based protein company. He was very adamant that his product be put next to the ground beef and the chicken, and yeah. not over on the other side of the store with the tofu and the seitan. Have you found <laughs> that where you put products, plant based products, affects how it's sold? And if so, can you sort of explain a little more about that? Yeah, I think that's that's a great question. And there's just a lot of debate around what to do for the customer. But I think one of the things we learned for the customer is there are reason for being. And we just realized at Walmart, based on the share that we had of that market, we were underserving. And so honestly, I don't think we had the customer credibility we didn't we hadn't given it the space and like there just wasn't the knowledge that we were in it and when you looked at the customer shopping in walmart it was very much a fresh perimeter customer than a center of store customer so we just did so much analytics around i see the competition putting it in with fresh however i don't know that our customer even gives us credit for it and so what we did was say, if we bring all of the frozen lifestyle together, it makes a statement. It's an aisle. It doesn't get lost. And at the end of the day, I don't know that this is exactly right, but I can tell you immediately we gained credibility. Immediately it said we're standing for an industry that maybe people wouldn't think Walmart would stand for. And it was exciting to see the swell. I would still say, we're learning on that journey. There is a point in time where things should move mainstream, but I don't think if the customer doesn't expect to find it in a store or maybe give us credibility, it's how do we, you know, change the perception and also bring people back into the category that might have migrated more to fresh and don't realize there's so many options outside of fresh now. Okay, thank you. There's an audience question here. I think this is probably more for, for Christy and Brian. Um, can meat flavor components like beefy, meaty peptides be something for improving the taste of plant-based products if produced by precision fermentation? Can Brian answer that one first? <laughs> you know, um, it's funny. There's another person on my team named Brian who's in R and D, and I would normally defer those type of questions to him. And I don't have him here as my my crutch, my, uh, crutch right now. Um, I think there's always an appetite for companies like us to to listen to the consumer, right? And what the consumer is telling us right now, based off of the data points that they see, is they want these plant-based products that they, they're curious about um, to mimic the taste of animal protein. So to certainly evaluate technology right like that and see if it's an application for um, our products to make them taste better, um, I think that's always an opportunity and something that we're always looking looking at across our portfolio. Yeah, actually, one of the things that I find most interesting about that, I, I can't necessarily speak to peptides versus um, fermentation of other types. Um, I will definitely defer to our director of product development on that. And she knows a ton about those those wonderful different options for creating um, uh, both volatile and stable flavor ingredients. And they have different purposes for different types of applications in terms of flavoring plant-based meat. Um, but one of the things I can speak to is the fact that one of the things we wanted to do when we designed a production system that was perfect for the production of plant-based meat was to be able to handle a variety of flavoring ingredients, including hopefully one day, including uh, cultured meat products into the incorporation of plant-based meat and make it such that we're properly and gently handling those ingredients because a lot of them are very volatile. And if you handle them 
in a way that um, increases too much heat because of um, aggressive mixing, or you've handled them in a way that interacts with the stainless steel for some reason, which isn't too common, but you can get metal flavor into your products as a result of chemical reactions. So we want to actually, we continue to innovate around this issue of making sure that the processing equipment that we've designed and we're currently in the process of deploying um, is, is perfect for the types of ingredients, especially flavor, and especially, as I mentioned earlier, about managing heat um, buildup in that flavor processing and that flavor incorporation, because we want to make sure that the consumer really does get a high quality product. Those flavors are so well made and, and have been so carefully researched and provided. Um, it's our pro it's our uh, sorry, it's our responsibility as a finished goods processor, which is what Rebellious Foods is, to bring forward that flavor and make it into a really good product that the customer gets to, you know, benefit from the whole, the whole, uh, all of the work and hard work that's gone into that really great flavor. I'm glad you mentioned cultured meat because that's the next question that's popped up here, and this is this is for everyone. Let's start with 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 Laura as the, as the newcomer. Mickey Bear asks, I would be so interested to hear the panelists' thoughts on cultivated cultured meat. Do they believe price points for that sort of meat could fall to animal meat levels or to be competitive with it? If so, what needs to happen to drive this? All right, that's a great question. <laughs> All I can say is if the quality is there, um, absolutely, I think. and. And that's the most important thing to the consumer, right? And what I would tell you as Walmart, how we think about that is, first of all, we can sell higher price things. However, for mainstream scale, one of the things that's extremely important to us is we expanded, like we doubled this space of like lifestyle and evolution of what protein looks like. And we realize we're working with a lot of entrepreneurs, right? These are people who in start, are in startup businesses. And it caused us to realize that we need to work differently with the entrepreneurs to actually understand the barriers and costs. And is the, a, a transparent conversation, oftentimes people feel the need to come in and have yes as the answer and, and quite honestly, we want to understand the barriers and understand the barriers to profit and lowering prices. And can you leverage our scale? Can we help in, if it's not in the ingredient piece of it, it could be in the logistics. And how do we break apart everything and have a really transparent conversation to enable us either to leverage our scale, help really modify and evolve so we can get to a price point that is an astronomical for the customer. Because at the end of the day, there should be no one in America that shouldn't be able to actually afford this type of product and eat better. And fundamentally, you know, Walmart's mission is save money and live better. And if you think about obesity and you think about the cheapest foods are actually maybe not the best for you, We've said we need to work better and different as an organization and be open and transparent and understand the complications of the industry and try to work to change them. Sangra, what are your thoughts? I mean, you 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 tried making cell-based milk. It's a really hard space to to break into. Do you think there will be a point at which at which cell-based milk becomes cost competitive with animal-based milk? Yes, um, I do believe so. And a lot of what I'm going to share is a lot more upstream. And in combination with what Laura just shared, I think uh, we, we can reach that price point um, in the years to come. So when it comes to cell-based meat production, there are a couple of technology um, hurdles that needs to be overcome. One is the most famous um, cell-based media. It's the same stuff that we need for cell-based milk. Basically, it's the nutrient broth that the cells need to live in to double and grow um, in, in an exponential rate. So this media traditionally from the pharma industry used to come from fetal bovine serum, um, as you can tell, fetal bovine. So it's not good for the environment, it's not good for animal cruelty. Um, a lot of scientists, a lot of startups are, are working hard, including Total Tree Scientific, to address um, this challenge. How do we use uh, technologies like precision fermentation to drive the cost of these growth factors and growth media down. So this is one of them. Second is um, the bioprocessing. 
how do we multiply the cells in the fastest time possible? If you look at um, growing cells, traditionally everything, including equipment, processes, um, the, the consumables, everything is medical grade, everything is pharma grade. How do we con transform all of that into food grade, something that is a lot um, larger scale and a lot cheaper? So this bioprocessing is something that a couple of startups, scientists are working on as well. The third one would be the cells themselves. How do we not genetically modify these cells or do it in a minimal manner so it doesn't affect um, the quality of the end product? So again, a lot of businesses are working on porcine like pig cells or, or chicken cells or um, cow cells, bovine cells, um, to make the cell-based meat um, that, that the industry is looking for. So all of these technological um, challenges, I think we are very close um, to overcoming them. Um, in Turtle Tree, we, are, we, we do have a couple of um, different technologies that we have that can plug into this ecosystem, which is why we launched launch, um, Turtle Tree Scientific to also provide these solutions to other cell-based meat companies. So once we're able to scale it up, I think uh, in combination with what Laura suggested, um, the scale, the logistic um, scale that Walmart or um, brands like them are able to provide, I think we can dramatically drop the price down to something that is more commercially viable for the food space. Well, and Thank one you. other thing I just wanted to add, you made me think of was we also need to have team members who understand the need to incubate and iterate. And so that was something very mindful as an organization. We said, you know, the standard of what excellence looks like is definitely different. And we need to build teams who understand that and work with you and don't expect a huge win right away, but that it's an, in, an incubation mindset and enable like the journey and going on it with you. So we just don't make quick changes to get out of industries as well. So as a retailer, we think that's fundamentally important to foster the incubation and give it a longer time than like the traditional food on the shelf. So let me ask in the interest of getting through a couple of more questions in the very short amount of time we have left, let me ask something different to Brian and Christy. Uh, Lauren Blake asks a lot of cost reduction and optimization can be done using GMOs, but many countries are strictly anti-GMO. Do you think that this will hinder progress in scaling up and bringing down costs? I don't think it'll necessarily hinder progress. I think that it will, um, it is a area that I think can be extremely beneficial. Um, all of Rebellious's products are non-GMO and will soon be non-GMO verified. So it is an area that we do prefer to, you know, cater and respect that customer's desire for a non-GMO product. But that's not ne not necessarily um, a, a game changer for other products um, in that, it can help bring the cost down, and that is helpful. Um, however, we also know that it is, it is a, a, a number of different things that can bring costs down. One of them is manufacturing, which of course is what we work on. One of them is ingredients, which as a reference to that non-GMO question, um, but these all can be integrated um, for a wide variety of meeting customers' needs, whether it be non-GMO or price or access or availability or the ability to grow products in a harsh environment. So all of those things can be utilized to be, and combined together to effectively meet the needs of various different markets. Okay, Brian, very quickly, do you want to close this out? Uh, I was just going to say, I think Christy nailed, nailed that one. Um, I think she summed it up perfectly. Okay, thank you. Well, we are out of time, unfortunately. This was a great panel. Thank you to Brian, Fengru, Laura, and Christy for, for being with us and for the Good Food Institute for hosting us. And, and thank you all for being here. Have a nice afternoon. Enjoy the rest of the Thank time. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Bye -bye. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah.